Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Parker, for um, the introduction and uh, for you and the Professor Hans' kind invitation. Uh, it's my great pleasure and honor, you know, to, to give the presentation. And the last time when I visited uh, Star National University, there must be uh, before 2010. I think it's probably more than 13 years ago. Cannot believe time flies so fast. So today's uh, talk, as the title suggested, I'm going to first talk about uh, uh, the device, the mystical device. And then I'm going to talk about how do we use uh, those devices for neuromorphic computing applications. Uh, first, let me briefly remind everybody, you know, the motivation behind this. Basically, those are the challenges for the future of computing. At the device level, we all know Moore's law is coming to an end. Um, in addition, um, the performance of memory is behind the processor and the gap is increasing over time, not decreasing. And also the uh, Dennard scaling law has ended uh, for probably over 15 years. That means uh, even if we can continually making the device smaller and cram more device on the chip, but we cannot utilize all of them simultaneously because uh, the current density or the power density of the chip is not constant anymore. It actually is increasing dramatically uh, when you cram more devices on the chip. So um, those are at the device level. Actually at architecture level, the challenge is as big, if not bigger. That is basically the Venoman bottleneck. We know our classic computer is based on Venoman architecture, which has a physically separate memory and the processor. Um, this was perfectly fine in the past when the computing did not involve a lot of data. But nowadays it's the big data era and most of the computing um, involve a huge amount of data. So constantly shuttling data between the two units become a very big problem. Um, the, and also this is a sequential process. It takes um, time and uh, this is a digital system. You need to convert the analog data into digital, the conversion for a huge amount of data also costs a lot of time and energy. So to solve those problems, we learn from the most efficient uh, computing system known so far, which is the brain. So the brain can uh, perform computing in its neural network. And uh, the neural network is really a network of neurons connected by synapse. And the information is stored in the network. And the data is processed where it is stored. So it is in memory computing and you do not need to uh, move data a lot anymore. And also the computing happens everywhere simultaneously. It is a parallel computing. And it can deal with analog data directly. It's analog computing. So with these three together, you are having a computing system very efficient and uh, has a high throughput. Actually, there is more. The brain is also known for its very efficient learning. Uh, data efficient, energy efficient, because the brain is using some neural science principles. If the device we use to build an artificial neural network can also implement such neural science principles, we have the chance to uh, approximate the natural intelligence. And so in order to perform those new type of computing, we need a new devices. And what is the the best device for such applications. Actually, uh, with Professor Huang and others, we put together this uh, uh, review. And in this read uh, plot, uh, we kind of uh, um, look at a different type of uh, uh, emerging memory technology um, and compare them together. As you can see here, uh, RM or memory stable devices uh, is currently um, in a favorable position for such applications. Uh, and there are other technologies such as, uh, uh, you know, uh, ferroelectric memory, um, which uh, although still cover a small region, 
in the Vita plot at this moment, but it, it has a very uh, uh, promising potentials just because it is relatively new in the game at this moment. Um, so in fact, uh, over a decade ago, uh, for RM, you know, most of the people were looking for memory application, actually including us at HP Labs. And we did a careful analysis and uh, uh, make this radar plot to just uh, um, compare, uh, you know, to figure out what's the best applications for RM or Memorista. And it turned out that actually um, memory application for those devices uh, is uh, the most demanding one. And uh, Neuromorphic computing actually is a low hanging fruit for this type of uh, application. The reason is that uh, uh, the computing application actually can avoid some uh, intrinsic disadvantage of uh, uh, RM, uh, such as uh, large variability. It can take advantage of the good properties intrinsically with RM, such as uh, large number of states, large amount of ratio, so on and so forth. So that's why um, after we realized that uh, computing is a low hanging fruit for um, RM and the memoristas, um, we have been focusing on uh, computing with such devices uh, in the last uh, decade in my uh, research group. And some of the major results are summarized here, which can be categorized into three groups. Uh, in the first group, we are trying to just build a machine learning accelerators. Um, the goal is to improve speed and energy efficiency. In the second category, we're mainly trying to use the dynamic property of uh, our memoristas to build a more faithful artificial synapse, a more faithful artificial neurons, artificial dendrites, then put them together to build a biorealistic neural network. Um, which can um, implement some of the neuron science principles. The goal here is uh, to get advanced intelligence in addition to speed and energy efficiency. In the third category, we're trying to build a toolkit for intelligent systems. Um, so the reason we use memories and RM is be obviously because they have some promising properties such as, okay, it can switch really fast. As we have shown here, we can switch it, uh, you know, within 85 picosecond on and off repeatedly. This actually was done uh, by uh, BJ, uh, that's uh, a former student of Professor Huang, um, uh, who was a postdoc um, in my group at that time. And also we can scale the device um, to, very small, like a two nanometer by two nanometer, and even build a small crossbar array and show the device still working nicely. Um, and the device is uh, analog and it has many resistance levels. We have shown over 256 resistance levels. Um, later you will see actually we can do a lot more than this. And the device is uh, stackable and you can stack them on top of each other. Here we have shown that we can stack eight layers of memoristas uh, to build a 3D neural network. And we use the, the uh, neural network to um, perform a video uh, process um, as kernels. So there are other good properties that I'm not going to talk about. Rather, I wanted to focus, talk about the challenges of, for those devices for computing applications. And uh, as you have seen um, in the previous slide that uh, um, the computing application has a different requirement on the device uh, performance than a memory applications. Um, so first, um, regardless computing or memory application, actually the mechanism understanding is critical, but unfortunately there are still missing a lot of missing holes uh, in the mechanism understanding uh, even after decades of study. So the reasons are shown here. So basically, uh, whatever responsible for the switching is buried underneath the top electrode, make it invisible to many uh, characterization techn uh, techniques. 
And also the switching region is localized both laterally and vertically. It is very small. And the switching active region can take a random location uh, from device to device and even from switching cycle to cycle. Now you already seen such switching can happen really fast, uh, which also make it harder to um, be captured. Um, for memory application, um, you mainly care the ending state, it's a static states. But for computing application, as you will see later, um, the entire switching process can be used for computing. So the dynamics is important. And we needed to know not only the ending static state, we also needed to know the actually switching process, the entire switching process. That's why we need to have some in situ techniques with very high spatial and temporal resolution to um, review the entire switching process which is very challenging. And in fact, uh, in this regard, um, actually uh, the, one of the most important works was done um, by Professor Huang from uh, Amsterdam National University a while ago. So in this work, uh, they used the in-situ TEM technology and they revealed that um, the core part of the switching in the model system titanium dioxide is a, a TS-47 magnetic phase. And uh, that, that's very important. And uh, there are more needed to be done in order to understand the entire switching process. And uh, um, you need techniques with a very high spatial and temporal resolution and the in situ technique to review the entire switching process. And you need to come by with modeling because uh, uh, and the extremely fast speed and uh, small skill, you will have to rely on modeling. And after you understand the mechanism, you also need to build a compact model for circuit design. So the combination of the in situ calculation and the modeling uh, are very important um, you know, for the future to understand the mechanism, um, the entire switching process. And for computing application, uh, another major requirement is uh, you need to have a lot of resistance levels. So the reason is uh, um, when you use those devices for computing on the edge, you will have uh, millions or billions of such crossbar arrays distributed on the edge of the cloud. It is not practical to train each crossbar array from scratch because uh, training is very costly. So a practical approach is really to train the neural network model on the cloud and then just uh, download the weight to the crossbar array on the edge. And uh, um, basically this process is just write uh, the synaptic weights in the crossbar array directly. What needed is that you needed to make sure the device uh, can have many resistance levels and uh, your written process is uh, very accurate among many, many devices. So the hardware we built here, um, uh, as shown here, uh, we have a fully integrated um, 256 by 256 crossbar array on top of the driving circuit. And these are the cross section of the device. And you know, to make the device have many, many resistance levels, uh, what you needed to do is to really suppress the noise. Because for a normal uh, device, you will have a large fluctuation as shown by the blue curve. So we figured out how to suppress such noise and that allows us to get uh, um, over 2000 resistance levels as shown here um, in individual device. And we can also program the entire 256 by 256 array experimentally as shown here. So um, for computing application, another uh, major requirement is uh, um, your device needed to have relatively high resistance. Um, the reason is uh, 
different for memory application and you just read one device or one column of the device for the computing application you need to read um, the entire array and if your device resistance is too low you cannot build a very large array and uh, with a small total current so the device resistance need to be high and also the device switching needed to be gradual because uh, the training in the training process you want to switch the device little by little rather than the big jump as you normally see in our traditional device so uh, the traditional device also has relatively high switching current um, and the switching is abrupt we want to change that for computing application we find that actually replace one of the electrode tantalum by ruthenium uh, actually we can get uh, um, low current switching to order the magnitude lower and the gradual on gradual off switching as you can see here this actually was done by um by uh dr uh, Jung, uh Jung Ho Jung, Jung, um, who was also a former uh, PhD student of uh, uh, Professor Huang's, and uh, um, he did this uh, work when he was a postdoc uh, uh, in our group. And uh, he also found that this type of switching, once you have ruthenium, it is oxide independent. You know, no matter you have hafnium oxide, you have aluminum oxide or tantalum oxide, or uh, yttrium stabilized conium, you can see the switching behavior quite similar. And so this means that ruthenium is playing a major role here. Um, in fact, to uh, nail down this, we did a TEM study, first an ex situ TEM study uh, for three devices uh, in pristine state, low resistance state, and high resistance state. You can see in the pristine state, the top and the bottom electrode is well separated by the tantalum oxide. For the device in the low resistance state, you can see ruthenium actually penetrate through the tantalum oxide. For the device that was switched back to high resistance state, you can see the ruthenium is cleaned up from the tantalum oxide. So this is the ex situ TEM. We also did an in situ TEM um, on an individual device. And in the pristine state, you can see um, the top bottom electrode is well separated. And then we in situ turn on the device, you can see there are ruthenium and kind of grow into the oxide from the filament. And for the same device, after we in situ turn it off, you can see the ruthenium in the oxide is gone. I give us the high resistance to, again. So the question is, okay, ruthenium is a mobile species and uh, uh, the device behaves quite differently from uh, uh, the oxygen vacancy species, uh, mobile species. But why is that? Why ruthenium can do that? So I know Professor Hong's group has done, um, you know, a, a lot of work with ruthenium electrode. And so this could be something, you know, interesting to look together in the future to figure out what's going on, why ruthenium mobile species can make such huge difference in the device. Uh, switching current and uh, uh, analog behavior. Okay, so another, uh, another challenge to build a large neural network array is the access device. As you, you will see later, um, for the crossbar array we built, now we use transistor as the, the access device. But if we want to uh, scale the device down in 2D and stack them up in 3D, we need a scalable 2D selector, and which is not there yet. And we all know that people, including us, have been using the insulate metal transition material as a selector, but those materials typically have a very small band gap. That means the off resistance of the device is still um, not resistive enough. And uh, that's not good enough to build a larger array. So we look at the tunneling selector, which actually is almost ideal uh, in many aspects as a selector, except 
the nonlinearity is usually not high enough um, because a single layer of tunnel barrier, you have a rectangular tunnel barrier shape like this. When you apply voltage between the two electrodes, you are reducing the barrier width, not the barrier height. Um, the current does not increase fast enough when you increase voltage. However, if you engineer the tunnel barrier into a triangular shape like this, when you apply voltage between the two electrodes, not only the barrier height, but also the barrier width are, are reducing simultaneously, that gives you a higher nonlinearity. So in reality, we do not have a perfect triangle shape. Rather, we can build a staircase shape to uh, approximate it. Um, to verify the idea, uh, we build a, a device with a single tunnel barrier and with a multi-layer tunnel barrier. In this case, we just add a, a thin layer of tantalum pentoxide in the middle of this single layer. Because the tantalum pentoxide has a smaller electron affinity than that of the tantalum nitride insulate, this has nitrogen rich. So you have a staircase tunnel barrier. And um, when we measure the device electrically, we find uh, no matter how we optimize the single layer tunnel barrier, we could not got, get the uh, nonlinearity over 1000. But inserting a middle layer here, we immediately improve the nonlinearity by 10 times. And the more recently, we make the uh, layers uh, much smoother so that it can sustain a higher voltage without breakdown. And we further increase the nonlinearity by another order of magnitude. And we, in fact, also build a small array of such integrated 1S, 1R cell. And this is uh, the tri-layer uh, selector. This is uh, um, the uh, non-volatile memory with each room stabilized the conium. Um, we <coughs> electrically form the device uh, with this uh, uh, tunnel barrier in series. And we did that for all the four devices in the array. And uh, that's the forming and the first off switching. And then we also show we can um, on and off switching each of the device in the array nicely. Um, so the issue here is uh, the tunneling selector still does not have a high enough uh, current density. Um, to support a, a skilled um, device. They still need some work. Then we look at other selector, which has a higher current density. This is a, a, a CB RAM like a device, except it is volatile and it is symmetric. So we call it a diffusive memory star. In this case, it has a, a very large nonlinearity uh, up to 10 to 10 or even more and a high current density. So when you use those devices as a selector, you will find actually you are using the nonlinearity between the uh, delay time and the applied voltage rather than the current voltage nonlinearity in a normal selector. Um, so the reason is that such a device is a dynamic device. Um, as shown by this pulse measurement, first you use this small pulse to make sure the device is in the off state. Then you use this large pulse to turn on the device. The device is turned on only after a 15 nanosecond delay time as shown by the right uh, curve, which is current. And then you can use a small voltage pulse to um, make sure the device goes back to off state after the high pulse. So this delay time, um, not surprisingly, a is exponentially um, reducing with increasing applied voltage. As shown here, uh, at a higher voltage, the device can have a shorter delay time being turned on quickly. With a smaller voltage on the device, it can be turned on only after a very long delay time. So the time and the voltage nonlinearity here can be used as a selector. Because in the crossbar array like this, for the target device, 
it always has a higher voltage on it, such as this voltage, so it can be turned on quickly. For the partially selected device in the array, it always see a, a much lower voltage, such as the uh, one volt here. Then it will need a much longer time to be turned on. If you select a pulse in between, you will guarantee only operate the target device without turning on the partially selected device. So that, that serves the role of selector, but in this case, it is a timing selector using the time voltage nonlinearity. And um, such concept is interesting, but um, the current issue is that the variation of our device is still large and the speed still needed to be improved. And yet with such a device, we uh, put it with uh, an array of the ionic transit-select memory. And uh, we have shown that uh, such 1S, 1R device can have a nice symmetric gradual programming, uh, which is very useful for the uh, machine learning with uh, memories to quad bar array. Okay, so in addition to this, actually for computing application, uh, we also want desirable dynamics in the device uh, for certain applications. Uh, for those, I'm going to uh, show you actually in the uh, bio-inspired computing part. So now I'm going to switch gear to talk about how do we use uh, um, such devices uh, to perform bio-inspired computing. And uh, those computing applications has different levels of bio-inspiration. First, with very little bio-inspiration in it. In this case, we just build uh, accelerators to accelerate vector matrix multiplication. Um, I guess uh, pretty much everybody knows that this vector matrix multiplication is uh, very important for machine learning as over 80 or 85 percent of the computing uh, in machine learning are actually vector matrix multiplication, which however is something our digital computer is not good at. Uh, because uh, to um, multiply a vector with a matrix in digital computer, you would multiply every element in the vector with every element in the matrix. You do that one by one, then you add the result together. Uh, it takes a lot of steps and time especially all the parameters are stored in memory. Each step you need to go to visit the memory, fetch data, then send the result back. That takes uh, too much time and energy for such computing with a lot of data. However, you can use a uh, memory cross bar array to for finish a vector matrix multiplication within one computing cycle in principle. So basically you map the mathematic matrix into the conductance of the memory array. And you use the, uh, the voltage, analog voltage to represent the element of the vector to be multiplied. Then to perform vector matrix multiplication, you just apply those voltages to the rows simultaneously. You collect the current here, you get the dot product. The reason of course is because uh, at each crossing point, you have a voltage applied on a resistor, you get a current here. The current is really the multiplication result of the voltage and the conductance. Basically, Ohm's law has done the multiplication for us. It does this everywhere simultaneously. If you collect the current here, you're adding all the current together. Basically, Kirchhoff's current law has done the summation for us. It also does this simultaneously. That's why it's a in-memory computing, parallel computing, and analog computing. So it can lead to orders of magnitude improvement in speed and energy efficiency. Um, to verify those ideas, we build the hardware. Those are the wafer, zoom in of the circuit, zoom in of the cell. We use transistor as a selector here. So we can freely program the entire array into anything we lack. Um, for example, into something like a DCT discrete cosine transform or, um, operator that can help you to process signal, such as a compressed image. This is uh, uh, an example, original image. This is the image compressed by the hardware I just showed you experimentally. 
And uh, to compare, we also plus, compress this with software. And you can see they are quite comparable already. So in, the case, in this case, the application is just a resistive network, except it's parallel analog and in-memory computing leading to high efficiency and throughput. Um, but the memory stable devices can do more than that, right? It can be reprogrammed. In other words, it can perform learning and supervise learning to recognize some pattern. So in order to demonstrate that, um, we use uh, the MNIST data set as an example, and uh, we partitioned the crossbar array we built into two layers of neural network. And the second layer of neural network has 10 output neurons corresponding to these 10 handwritten digits. And then you can convert the gray level of each pixel in the picture into analog voltage to serve as the input to the first layer. Because the synaptic weights are random to begin with, um, these 10 neurons fire randomly regardless of those input. Now you can use the back propagation um, to figure out how to change the synaptic weights, then manually change it so that whenever the input is zero, the first neuron fire. Whenever the input is one, the second neuron fire, so on and so forth. You can train the neural network uh, this way, like uh, what you're seeing here. We use a uh, 1,000, 10,000, and 20,000 images to train the neural network so that the network become better and better in recognizing unseen uh, new images with over 90% something uh, accuracy. Um, so this shows it can perform unsupervised learning. But the issue is you can see you need thousands, 10,000 images to do that. You need to perform a lot of back population calculation in order to do that. And uh, it, the learning is very inefficient. Um, our brain doesn't do that. Our brain can learn from just a couple of examples and learn automatically. It's more like unsupervised learning in the brain. So can our device also do something like that? So in order to do that, our device needed to be different, needed to be able to uh, perform some new features, just like the biosynapse and neurons. What are the new features? So we look at the biosynapse. Um, in this case, this is the pre-neuron, post-neuron, they form a synapse here. The synaptic weights are really the number of the ion channels or how conductive of each channel. So those synaptic weights are like the non-volatile memory I showed you so far. In order to change the non-volatile memory uh, conductance, we just apply a large voltage to it. But for this uh, biosynapse, it's not that simple. You have to go through a dynamic process like this. First, you need to have a large enough spike that is large enough to open the so-called NMDA ion channel. Once this channel is open, some cation such as calcium, sodium can go through this channel, get into the post neuron. This is the diffusion process of cations. So once calcium get to here, it can trigger some bioactivities to install more ion channels or make the existing ones more conductive. Basically update the synaptic weight. But before you get to here, you need to go through this dynamic process, which is controlled by the diffusion of cations. So that's why to build a faithful synapse, in addition to the non-volatile memory element, you also wanted to have another element that can control the dynamics. The dynamics is better to be a diffusion dynamics of some ions, like cations. So with that in mind, we build a diffusive memory to do that. Um, as shown here, this is a um, in situ TEM of a diffusive memory, so the two electrode. When you apply electrical bias between the two electrodes, you will see some change in the gap. And after you remove the electrode, 
uh, uh, remove the voltage, you will see more changes. Um, so this can be better seen in the snapshots. Um, here, the two electrodes, um, and uh, in the middle, it's a silver doped silicon nitride. When you apply electric, uh, electrical bias initially, um, the current is low, but you can see silver uh, start to move into the gap. And the current remain low here until at this moment, the silver form a complete channel bridging the top and the bottom electrode, the current jump to a high level. And this channel remain to be something around four nanometer in diameter. So this has been shown a number of times. Uh, what uh, also very interesting is uh, what happens when you remove the electrical bias here. And at this moment, remove electrical bias and zero electrical bias, you can see this silver filament actually diffuse, goes back and breaks the channel by itself from a sphere and zero electrical bias. So the sphere shape shows the driving force for this diffusion is the interfacial energy minimization between silver and the silicon uh, nitride. So this diffusion process, the dynamics can be used to build a better synapse. Uh, as shown here, uh, in addition to the non-volatile memory element, we have a, a diffusive element to give us the dynamics we need. And uh, with such device, um, now we can naturally reproduce uh, the complex short-term plasticity, um, like the electrical measurement data shown here, such complex behavior have long been observed in the biosynapse, the short-term plasticity. And also we can naturally get the long-term plasticity such as spike time independent plasticity as shown here, different from the normal STDP demo you have seen here, we use identical spikes for pre-spike and post-spike. And we don't engineer or play trick here. We do not like let the two spike overlap to get uh, the synaptic weight change. Rather, they just uh, behave like the bio spikes um, because the, the device, the synapse itself has a dynamic timer in it. You don't need the pulse to overlap. So basically, once you have those dynamics engineered in the device, it can naturally reproduce uh, uh, many important features of the biological synapse. So that's a synapse. In order to build a neural network, you also need a neuron. And the, one of the major function of a neuron is to generate action potential. If you look at closely how the action potential is generated, the ion channel open and close diffusion of ions play a very important role. So you need the ion channel and the membrane capacitor to form a neuron. And we can see here for diffusion memoristor, it can emulate the ion channel very nicely. This is ion channel close, then open. After um, open firing, the ion channel close by itself, let the neuron goes back to its resting state after firing. So basically we can use the diffusive memory to emulate the ion channel, and we can use a capacitor to emulate the membrane capacitor. We can form an um, um, artificial neuron. And uh, this capacitor actually can be the intrinsic capacitor of the diffusive memory uh, In other words, you can just use one single nano device to build an uh, artificial neuron, as we did here, the electrical testing data to show that it show very nice leaky integration and fire behavior. These are the input spike. These are the integration of the membrane potential. And uh, once it reach threshold, it fires. After that, it goes back to its resting state and start to accumulate again. So now we have both uh, the synapse and the neurons, so we can integrate them together to build a small neural network, which is the first fully memoristic spike neural network. Even though it is still small, but it can also perform some advanced functions because the dynamics in it, it can perform something like unsupervised learning. 
And in order to do that, we need a two of such neural network. So the first layer serves as a convolutional layer. Each column is a kernel, which is connected with a neuron. And all those eight kernels can extract the feature from the uh, input pattern. Those extracted features are represented by the firing pattern of those output neurons. So the firing pattern of the output neurons serve as uh, the input to the second layer of neural network. So the second layer of neural network has, uh, uh, in this case, has only three output neurons. Um, so basically, we use these three neurons to categorize four input pattern. And initially, because the synaptic widths here are random, um, regardless of the input, these three neurons fire randomly. So if for supervised learning, we would uh, perform backpropagation, figure out how to change the synaptic widths, then manually change it. But for unsupervised learning, we don't do that. We actually don't do anything, but keep repeating those inputs let the neural network evolve by itself. The rules of the dynamic interaction between the synapse and the neurons, essentially they are performing a happy-like learning. And only after 30 cycles of input, you can see the synaptic widths change to a state that these three neurons do not fire randomly anymore. Rather, whenever the input is A, the first neuron fire. Whenever the input is S, second neuron fire whenever the input is U and M, the first neuron fire. So basically the three neurons, um, the small neural network, think U and M are close enough to be put in the same category. So this is a, a simple demonstration, um, but it is exciting to see that once you uh, engineer some uh, bio features into your device, uh, um, the small neural network can already perform some advanced learning algorithms such as unsupervised learning makes the entire process efficient and simple. Okay, so, so far what I have talked about are resistive neural networks. And in fact, the capacitive neural network um, can have some advantages, but have not been studied almost at all. Um, in the capacitive neural network, you can imagine in principle, you do not have a static current running through it. So you do not generate a lot of dual heat uh, to waste energy. And you can also recycle a lot of electrical signals by the capacitors. And the capacitors can be um, very convenient to integrate spikes. So they are especially uh, useful for spiking neural network. So in order to build a capacitive neural network, you need memory capacitors. In, instead of memory resistors. So memory capacitors, are, you can think of them just capacitors uh, that have memory and can be electrically reconfigured. We do not have a, a real memory capacitor yet. Um, so we build a pseudo memory capacitor to use. Um, in this pseudo memory capacitor, we have first a fixed capacitor with high K dielectric. So this capacitor has a high capacitance. And uh, we put it in series with a diffusive memory star, which in the off state is really a capacitor, but a smaller capacitor uh, with smaller capacitance. So two capacitors in series, the total capacitance is dominated by the small one. That's why initially you see the device has a small capacitance. And now when you increase the voltage, to a certain threshold, you can turn on the diffusive memory star. Basically, you build a conducting channel um, to shunt the, this capacitor. There are only one capacitor left, which is the bigger one. That's why the capacitance of the, this device jump to a high level. And when you reduce the voltage, this uh, diffusive memory star goes back to its off state, and you recover to a two capacitor in serious mode again, then the capacitance decrease. You can do that with negative voltage similarly. And it turned out that such a pseudo memory capacitor um, is like a, a 
leaky integration in the fire network. As shown by the electrical measurement data, these are the input spike, these are the integration and the fire uh, of the device. So in this case, um, this diffusion memory is volatile. It serves as a neuron, but you can also use a CD-RAM type device uh, with a non-volatile device here, then you get uh, a non-volatile uh, capacitor that can change its capacitance. So you, that can be used as a synapse. The non-volatile part used as a synapse, we can integrate the synapse with the mem capacitive neurons and to build the first capacitive neural network. And again, it is still very small, but it can show some uh, interesting functions such as associative learning. And uh, this, this um, is shown by the electrical measurement data here. Uh, associative learning has been um, demonstrated with resistive network for many times. And um, this is the first time um, we have sh shown that it can also be done with the uh, capacitive neural network. And also we can use the capacitive neural network we built to perform dot product. Uh, the network synapse are uh, 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 capacitance and the neurons are capacitive neurons and the inputs are identical spikes with a different spiking rate. So uh, the electrical testing data is shown here. Basically it shows uh, um, this capacitive neural network can perform um, dot product or vector matrix multiplication nicely. It can easily deal with the spiking signal. So again, this has been shown you know, with resistive network routinely. And this is the first time uh, we show that it can also be done with the capacitive neural network. And of course, uh, this is just the beginning. And uh, there are still a lot of work needed to be done to get a better mem capacitors and uh, have a larger capacitive neural network for computing demo in the future. Okay. So I will use a few slides to quickly summarize. Um, so basically we have seen that, you know, you can use CMOS devices to build anything you want, like a, a neural network. But the CMOS devices uh, were not created or optimized for this purpose. They are not efficient for this purpose. That's why you need tens of transistors to simulate, not even e emulate a synapse. You need more transistors to simulate a neuron. But in the brain, we have just too many synapses and neurons. For this number of synapse neurons, if we do it by capacitors, a rough calculation, you will find that easily you need more than 10 million chips to do that. And this is obviously not efficient, if possible at all. Um, Fortunately, we have the emerging devices, right? We have seen that we can use a one or two emerging devices to emulate neurons or synapse. And those devices are even smaller than the biosynapse and neurons. So just um, you know, to consider the number to emulate this many synapse and neurons, all the emerging devices you need can probably fit on a four inch wafer. So that, that's nice. Why the CMOS devices are not good for this purpose? Actually, it's shown here. Uh, we know the, synap uh, the CMOS devices, you have silicon. The function is defined by the dopant profile. The dopant are actually ions. But those ions are not moving. For operation, you're only operating in Particularly, 